Hello, and uh, welcome to another one of our Cromwellian Conversations. My name's Stuart, I'm the curator of the Cromwell Museum in Huntingdon. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be with you again here today. Another one of our lockdown museum from home videos, as uh, the UK is still in lockdown, although as it's starting to ease at the moment, hopefully in the next few weeks we'll be back in the museum, you'll be able to come and visit us, and we'll also be able to show you some more of the collection. Uh, for today's video, I talk a little bit about uh, Cromwell's family background. So this is his ancestry more than him himself, although I'm going to talk a little bit about his early life. So this is descent from Thomas Cromwell and sort of the immediate family tree that led down to uh, Cromwell's descent, as it were. So I'm going to talk a little bit about today. So, um, as I mentioned in a previous video, uh, Oliver Cromwell is distant related to Thomas Cromwell, uh, the famed Earl of Essex, who was uh, the sort of chief minister and hatchet man to King Henry VIII, who of course has been uh, immortalised most recently and perhaps best known by the novels of Hilary Mantel. Um, two are distant related. Um, uh, basically, Thomas Cromwell had a sister, um, uh, Catherine Cromwell, who married a Welsh um, lawyer by the name of Morgan Williams. And it's from their marriage that Oliver Cromwell is descended. Um, Catherine and Morgan had a son by the name of Richard Williams, who, as a young man in his teens, went to court where he was effectively the protégé, secretary, general factotum to his uncle Thomas Cromwell. And as Thomas Cromwell sort of uh, continued to rise at court and become increasingly significant to King Henry VIII, so Richard Cromwell also continued to benefit by this association. And indeed, even when Thomas Cromwell fell from power in 1540, by that time, uh, Richard was so well established at court that uh, actually he continued to be one of Henry VIII's favourites and continued to do very well by this association. So um, Richard Williams, as he originally was, uh, was granted various bits of property by the king. He seems to have adopted the name Cromwell in honour of his uncle, possibly at Henry VIII's suggestion, it's been said, um, around about the time 1530. Now, this might seem quite strange to us today, although we're used to people perhaps changing their names by deed poll, um, as is, is the case in the UK today. No such system existed in the sort of 16th century. Um, there wasn't the sort of fixed use of surnames. There wasn't even fixed sort of sense of spelling of surnames as we might associate now. So people sort of chopped and changed their names quite often. And um, even it's interesting that uh, over the next hundred years or so that um, the Cromwell family still continue to recognise there was this link originally to their surname Williams uh, going back to the uh, the 1530s um, because every time they made property transfers or any kind of legal documents they seem to have signed it either uh, Cromwell alias Williams or Williams alias Cromwell just in case there was any sort of challenge over the ownership of the property just to make sure that everything was sort of tied up nicely and legally. So Richard seems to have done very nicely out of his sort of association both with his uncle and also uh, by uh, becoming one of King Henry VIII's favourites at court. Um, he was granted various amounts of property in the county of Huntingdonshire, um, including the site of the former abbey at Ramsey um, and also a former nunnery at Hinchinbrook. Both of these would become family homes to the Cromwell family. Um, after his uncle fell from power, it seems to be that he was still say, retaining the king's favour. He became the High Sheriff of Cambridgeshire in 1541. He accompanied the king on campaign uh, in France. And uh, by the time he died in 1544, he'd acquired large amounts of property and was a, an extremely wealthy man. Uh, his eldest son Henry, who at that point was only seven years of age, uh, inherited his father's titles and property. Um, and um, when he grew up, he became, again, an uh, immensely wealthy and powerful man in the, the old county of Huntingdonshire. Um, uh, he was the one who built Hinchinbrook House, the building, or at least substantial parts of the building, is the one that we still see today, now parts of Hinchinbrook School. Um, he was uh, so wealthy that he was nicknamed locally the Golden Knight. Apparently, whenever he made trips to his uh, family home at Ramsey, if he passed through the town, he would sometimes uh, shower arms, gold coins out to the people of the town. He was known for his largesse in that regard. Um, he spent his summer months living at Ramsey and the family property there, and the winter months living at Hinchinbrook. Um, whilst living at Hinchinbrook in 1564, he entertained Elizabeth I while she was um, uh, sort of touring the country on one of her royal progresses at the house. 
Um, he had two wives, his first wife, Joan, with whom he had uh, 11 children, and then his second wife, uh, Lady Susan, who died in 1592 under um, slightly suspect circumstances. She died of a, uh, an illness at the time, which many people attributed to having been cursed by a witch. And um, it said that she was uh, involving herself in the case, the famous Witches of War Boys case, um, which was uh, grouped around a sort of family called Samuel, uh, Alice Samuel, her husband and her daughter, who were supposedly uh, cursing people in the village of War Boys to the north of Huntingdon. And uh, Lady Susan, who involved herself in this particular case, went to visit the alleged witch and supposedly was cursed and fell ill and, and died as a result. Um, now, of course, we know today that this wouldn't have been the case, but of course, to the sort of superstitious 16th century mind, um, there was a very clear association. And uh, Alice Samuel, her husband and daughter, were put on trial for witchcraft in Huntingdon, uh, found guilty and were uh, hanged out on Mill Common in Huntingdon in 1593. Um, by the time that uh, he died in 1604, say Sir Henry had become uh, an immensely wealthy and powerful man. Um, his eldest son, who followed him, uh, Sir Oliver, um, was unfortunately the one who lost most of the family property. Um, again, he was a, a man who, who became uh, hugely well involved in terms of the sort of the county set. He was involved becoming uh, justice of the peace. He'd been high sheriff for the county. On the 27th of April 1603, Sir Oliver Cromwell entertained the soon-to-be King James I of England. Uh, James VI of Scotland had inherited the throne upon the death of Elizabeth I and was now on his royal progress south uh, to his coronation in London. And uh, he stayed overnight on the 27th of April 1603 at Hinchinbrook House, where he was royally entertained. It was said that uh, never did a king sort of be, uh, be entertained in such a, a regal fashion by uh, one of the common sort of uh, one of the commoners, one of his subjects, and uh, Sir Oliver not only kind of gave him this this massive feast with uh, all of these entertainments, but also gave him a huge amount of wealthy gifts, apparently including quote a cop of gold, uh, goodly horses, deep mouthed hounds, diverse hawks of excellent wing. So he basically had no expense spared in entertaining the uh, new monarch. As a reward for his services, uh, King James uh, gave uh, Sir Oliver a knighthood at his coronation, ordered a knight him as a knight of the bath, which was a, um, a sort of knightly honour given to uh, coronation ceremonies. And uh, obviously he was sort of so taken with Sir Oliver in terms of the, the entertainment that he'd received that he visited Hinchinbrook regularly and used it almost as a sort of royal hunting lodge. Um, unfortunately, of course, royal entertaining was rather expensive and uh, um, as a result of which, um, the, uh, the, the, the virtually bankrupt of Sir Oliver into the process, the proceeds of sort of entertaining the king, as a result of which he was forced to contemplate selling Hinch in Brook House in order to clear his debts. Um, and unfortunately, um, his initial plan was to sell it to the king so that he could use it as a hunting lodge. It seemed a natural fit, given the fact that the king was such a frequent visitor. Uh, unfortunately, as the plan was about to go through in 1625, King James inconveniently dropped dead first. And as a result of which, two years later, um, Sir Oliver was forced to sell Hinchinbrook House to Sir Sidney Montague instead. So it passed to the Montague family, the future earls of Sandwich. And Sir Oliver retired to his secondary estate at um, Ramsey, uh, Ramsey Abbey, where he lived out his days until 1655. Now, interestingly, Sir Oliver Cromwell was uh, the uncle of our Oliver Cromwell, the most famous one. Um, interesting, he was a royalist during the Civil War, so he was diametrically opposed to his nephew, his nephew who was his namesake, um, and also he was his godfather. And uh, apparently in 1643, uh, the Oliver Cromwell went and confronted his uncle at Ramsey and stood there um, sort of uh, confronting him on, on the sort of the, 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 their sort of different opinions um, in terms of their sort of uh, the, their divisions in terms of the Civil War. Uh, it's worth saying, by the way, that even though uh, Sir Oliver supported the Royalist cause during the Civil War um, and lost quite a bit of his property confiscated for supporting the wrong side, after the Civil War was over, his nephew did help him get some of those properties back again. So his, some of his fortunes were at least restored. Um, 
So uh, Sir Oliver's younger brother, Robert Cromwell, was uh, the father of our Oliver Cromwell. And uh, basically he had uh, ten children. Um, only one boy survived, who was Oliver, who was uh, born on the 25th of April, 1599. Um, the uh, sort of register of the baptism still survives in the county archives, although St John's Church, in which Cromwell was christened, um, is no longer stands. The churchyard is there today, but uh, the, the church itself disappeared in the late 17th century through disrepair. Um, the parish register still survives, and uh, you can see here from the county archive um, the sort of Latin text recording Oliver Cromwell's baptism. Uh, somebody has scrawled at the top, um, England's cursed these five years. Um, so uh, obviously it shows that uh, that tells you everything you need to know in terms of differing opinions about Oliver Cromwell, uh, because that's been scrawled above, and then somebody in turn has scrubbed that back out again. So it shows that Cromwell has been nothing if not controversial uh, throughout it, basically the, the entire of history since his time. Uh, so he was born, as I say, to uh, Robert Cromwell and his wife Elizabeth Stewart. Um, we know very little about Oliver Cromwell's childhood. Uh, there are all sorts of stories that have been written about this. Um, many of you might have read the late famous Ladybird books published back in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, um, of which there was a sort of story from history one about Oliver Cromwell that told these wonderfully colourful stories about how Cromwell, as a little boy, um, uh, was uh, involved in a fight with the uh, young Charles I at Hinchinbrook House when the king was visiting or the future king was visiting there with his father um, or how as a baby he was kidnapped by uh, his uncle's pet monkey and carried up onto the roof of Hinchinbrook House um, there's these wonderful stories and these wonderful illustrations that you can see here um, there's other little stories told locally about how for instance um, as a young boy Cromwell fell into the local river and um, was fished out by a local curate who sort of saved him from drowning and years later the curate saw Cromwell marching through the town with his troops and said that you know, in view of his disloyalty to the king he'd rather that he'd thrown him back into the river again. Now, of course, all of these stories are lovely legends, but there's absolutely no evidence for them whatsoever. Uh, these stories appear in the 1830s and 1840s, and it's basically the 19th century sort of the Victorians who were fascinated by Cromwell, who regarded him as a great hero, and um, because they were frustrated by the fact that there was so little known about his childhood, they basically invented a backstory for him, and uh, sort of created these sort of stories, myths, and legends that uh, have been passed down to us today. What we do know is that he, he studied at the local grammar school between 1610 and 1616, uh, the building which of course is today the Cromwell Museum, and uh, there he was educated by the uh, the local parish priest and schoolmaster Thomas Beard. Uh, Thomas Beard um, was known for having written a book called The Theatre of God's Judgments, uh, which was a kind of anti-Catholic polemic in which he described the various punishments um, being uh, conducted in hell against people people who were regarded as sinners, uh, not just Catholics, but people like Christopher Marlowe, for example, is, is somebody who's picked out on as somebody who's being sort of having a little dissolute lifestyle and therefore worthy of God's punishment. Now, some people used to interpret this as being that um, Beard was therefore a Puritan and perhaps that in, while he was educating Cromwell, he influenced him in his beliefs. Um, there's no particular evidence for this whatsoever. Um, Beard actually, uh, in terms of his writings, simply was reflecting a sort of deep vein of anti-Catholicism that unfortunately existed in England at that time, which is sort of common practice. Um, and he would have conducted sort of Cromwell's education, very much a classical education. So kind of primary, or nearly all the lessons conducted in Latin, uh, primarily reading and translating texts, um, some lessons in Greek, a bit of mathematics, certainly Bible study, a bit of history inside there, but very much a kind of classical education designed for the students who were the sons of the freemen of the town, of which Robert Cromwell was one, um, that uh, basically preparing them to go on to Oxford or Cambridge. Uh, Cromwell lived as sort of, as I say, or came from a family that was sort of what I would describe as middling sort. His uncle had inherited all the money and all the property. Um, Robert Cromwell was a sort of uh, burgess of the town. Um, he'd served as a justice of the peace. He was somebody who was relatively important to the local community, but he wasn't that exceptional. So it was a sort of, you know, comfortable existence, I suppose, if you like, uh, as a childhood. But we know very little about it, as I say, apart from this education.
that he would have received at the local grammar school. And when he left there in 1616, he went on to Sydney Sussex College at Cambridge. Uh, he doesn't seem to have been a terribly good um, uh, student there, um, uh, so supposedly more interested in um, uh, playing sort of exercises in the field than he was in the classroom. So, uh, as I say, more of a kind of sporting background rather than learning his lessons. So talk more about uh, Cromwell's later life and how he sort of becomes more significant a bit later on in future videos. But that hopefully gives you a bit of a, uh, an overview in terms of Cromwell's family background and um, how sort of uh, he, why his family might have been sort of relatively significant in terms of Huntingdonshire and what his connection, of course, to Thomas Cromwell is. I hope you found that interesting. Um, we'll be doing, of course, more videos about Cromwell's life and about different aspects of this period in the 17th century. We've also got some really interesting sessions lined up with some uh, historians over the next few weeks as well, discussing different aspects of this period. So do look out for those. Uh, in the meantime, please do stay, stay safe in this uh, lockdown period uh, during the coronavirus. Hopefully in the next couple of weeks, you'll actually get to come and visit us at the Cromwell Museum if you're inclined to do so. Um, uh, please uh, do remember to like this video and to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Also, if you're interested, please do follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Details are in the uh, title card at the end of this video. Uh, you'll also see there a link through to a page on our website where if you do feel inclined, you can also donate to the museum. Uh, we are an independent charity and we do rely on your support, particularly uh, during these times where the museum isn't getting um, very much income in terms of visitors through the door. Um, otherwise, I look forward to seeing you again soon and thank you very much for joining us.